get these truths to be self-evident? I mean uh, this in a couple of important ways. The first way is the obvious way in which uh, the number of caribou on the landscape is obviously declining. But I mean this in a different way, and that is that there's a, a what appears to be a big disconnect between what our public expectations are around recovery, which is related to the objectives that we see in our recovery strategies, plans, and policies, and what we're likely to deliver on the ground in terms of the box that we've been put in. And that's really been driven home this week for any of you who were at the Environment Canada presentation on Wednesday, talking about how they are fully expecting that all caribou herds will be recovered everywhere. If they're in bad shape, it'll just take a little longer. And then listening to the technical presentations yesterday about how everything is pretty dismal and going down quickly. And just to echo what Sam was talking about yesterday, that I think it's pretty clear that management is the problem and not science. We have enough research to know what the, what the problem is, and it's really just time to get on with it. And what we're having trouble with is delivering the last mile, as I say. We have that body of research, but we have failed to package it in a way that can be used by managers and decision makers to affect change. And so I want to focus today on that last mile and taking that information that we have gathered and putting it in a way that we can actually get some decisions and some changes being made on the ground. And as Chris Ritchie noted yesterday, it's a nut that we've managed to crack to some extent in BC using some of the methods that I want to talk about today. So somewhat pompously, maybe I'm calling this a generalized management framework. And what we do in this, we're basically dealing with two domains. We're dealing with the policy domain and the technical domain. And if you remember your first year philosophy, the policy domain is kind of the normative approach, the normative framework. It's all about what ought to be. And we have a technical domain, which is about, is, is about what is. So as technical people, we in, live in this world about what is, where we have the body of liter literature that we've uh, accumulated. We have a lot of expertise from people being on the ground. We have our original data. We have the simulations, a uh, number of simulations that project the future. All this technical information. On the policy side, we're focused on objectives. What is it that we want the future to look like? What is our tolerance that we may not get there in terms of risk tolerance? And resourcing, because we're always trying to make decisions about how, how to allocate uh, resources that are always insufficient. I also put in that basket of risk tolerance the uh, much mentioned precautionary principle. I think it's important to note that the precautionary principle is not a scientific principle, it's a normative concept and therefore belongs in the policy domain. And I think that one of the problems that we get into often is when we start asking our technical experts to make decisions about what the objective should be, suggesting that there's some sort of technical basis for that when there often isn't and asking us about how precautionary we should be, when really that's a normative concept. But there is a place where those two pieces meet, and that's in the middle when we're trying to develop these management options, where we can have technical experts telling us what can be done, and the policy people telling us whether that's a publicly acceptable thing to do, and whether or not we have the resources to actually do it. And we have these two domains, and we need to bring them together somehow to to get, this, get down this last mile and put the information in a form that can be used by managers and decision makers to actually move ahead. And that's what I'm calling a management model. Now, I don't know how many times we heard the word model yesterday, but I think it was a lot. We've got a lot of models. There's a, everybody's got a model. And, and uh, the one that I'm talking about when I refer to a management model, I think is a little bit different. And I want to talk about how management models differ from the models that we've been talking about for the most part yesterday. And the first and most important thing is that they really need to be transparent. They need to be transparent to decision makers and stakeholders, which means they need to be simple. That doesn't mean they need to be simple-minded. You don't, you don't build models with the expectation that people are stupid, but you build it with the expectation that they know nothing, and you have to be able to convey that information in a simple enough way that it can be grasped and people can understand the trade-offs that need to be made. The second thing is it has to be very focused on outcomes. And that means we have to say that if we do A to this extent, we expect to see a response B to this extent. And it has to be that explicit, and it has to be tied that closely together. 
we see lots of flow charts with boxes and arrows, but unless we start talking about effect sizes, what exactly we have to do, what exactly the response we expect to see is, we're not going to get a lot of traction. The third thing is incorporating uncertainty. And I think we do a fairly good job in this, in this uh, respect in a lot of the simulation models we do. Management is about decision making. Decision making is about prediction. Prediction, predicting the future is always uncertain. There's never enough data to predict the future with certainty, so we have to express that uncertainty in a meaningful way. And the fourth thing, ideally, is that we would assess costs in our model. Because that's when the rubber hits the road. People have to make decisions about how to allocate scarce resources. So some of you are thinking maybe we already do some of this modeling. We do a lot of forecast modeling. But I would argue that they don't necessarily meet these four criteria. And if we look to other disciplines, we see these kinds of models show up, for instance, in the medical field around clinical diagnostic models. So if you think of the medical world, we have a lot of research that goes on at the top where you're testing the efficacy of drug for A versus drug B or longitudinal studies. But then when, where the rubber hits the road, the last mile, so to speak, is when you get to the hospital and you come into the hospital, there are indicators that you're tested for. That suggests what's wrong with you. There are certain treatments that are available and there are certain probabilities of outcomes that are associated with that. So if you've got shortness of breath, they determine a bunch of they look at you in terms of a bunch of indicators and a bunch of tests. They say you've got congestive heart failure. If you go on beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and reduce your salt intake, you have an 85% chance of being alive in five years, for example. Doesn't mean you're not going to die tomorrow. Doesn't mean you won't be alive in 20 years, but that is expressed to you in a probabilistic way. And that is a fairly simple model that everybody can understand and people can make intelligent decisions without being a domain expert on how ACE inhibitors work, can make intelligent decisions about how we manage our own health. And we can do exactly the same thing in the, in the resource field. But we don't do a very good job of it. And sometimes we explain it in words, but we're, we're, very rarely do we apply probabilities to that. We come close, and people have talked through these models actually quite effectively in a couple of places yesterday. And we did hit on one probably a very simple management model, which was Stan's model that spend $75 for every household for the next 50 years and you get six sustained caribou herds. Very simple, the trade-off is understandable, and if you, we get to the point where people accept that that is the way things are, then we can shift the discussion to the way things ought to be. And you might, some people argue, well, I'd rather spend more money for more herds or less. But that's, simple, that's a simple management model that captured everybody's attention and stimulated this discussion about what ought to be. And that's where we need to get to. And in our experience, that once you get to that characterization of what the world looks like and an agreement and a consensus on the way things are, and the focus can shift to the way things ought to be, that when that gets handed to decision makers, it's amazing how quickly those decisions can be made because that's what they're paid to do. That's the realm that they're used to working in. What are the options? What's in the most public interest? Let's go. Let's hit the ground running. The dirty little secret of this, of course, is that management models are not an option. The only question is whether or not you're going to write them down. If we go back to our medical example, people have always been getting sick. And as long as there's been doctors, they've been making clinical diagnoses, suggesting uh, what the outcome might be under different treatment scenarios. The treatments might have been bloodletting and leeches, and the outcomes might have been mostly death but still they had that model, and they weren't stopped because they didn't have enough data. What's happened over time, of course, is the certainty in that outcome, and the, and, the, and the outcomes have become better over time as we've collected more information. And that really is what adaptive management is all about, is becoming more certain with your outcomes as you gain more information. But you always have that model. And that's exactly what we have in, in resource management. If you're a manager and you're charged with, with taking care of some certain system, you can't be stopped by the fact that you don't have enough primary research to actually explain how that system works. You're just faced with more uncertainty, and you want to direct research or inventory towards the, the best places where you can reduce that uncertainty. So the only question is whether or not we're actually going to make these explicit. And as I said, there's some, a real advantage to making these models explicit so that everybody can understand uh, the, the state of the nation as it is, and what our options are, what the downstream consequences are of those of that model and implement what is best uh, given the box we're in. 
people can argue about making that box bigger or changing the box, that's fine. We're li we live in a democracy and everybody can do that, but we need, to, first of all, as domain experts to understand what we think, we mod what we think the actual uh, state of the nation is. So this is essentially what we did with the boreal caribou piece in uh, the Northeast BC. Our approach was to develop a, ca a collaborative management model that would serve as our working hypothesis. It's not necessarily a scientific model. It draws broadly on everything that everybody knows so we can get to the point where we say, this is the way we think the system works. And if this is the way we think the system works, these are the consequences. Let's attach some, real, some projections to what our consequences are, recognize that it's uncertain, and then we, we set ourselves up for some decision making. And when I say you have to start with a simple model, I mean you have to start at a, with a really simple model. And I don't, I don't think I've heard anything in the last day that really moves too much off this very central hypothesis about what we think is going on. We have pounds of meat on the ground in terms of ungulates that's creating some, that's, that's generating some population of wolves that is then eating caribou. And that's being mediated by landscape condition because we have early sterile habitat that is encouraging more ungulates and we have some linear features that is increasing the efficiency with which wolves are killing caribou. That's pretty much the central nugget of things. And sure, we might have beavers propping up wolves to some extent. We know that bears are also uh, affecting caribou for a whole bunch of reasons that are, are clear to people in this room. It's unlikely that we're going to be doing a lot of beaver management or bear management as part of the system. This is pretty much what we have to work with. And the point here is that you don't make the, the, the model more complicated just to add precision. You only make the, more, the, make the model more complex if you need, if that assists in the decision making in reducing the uncertainty in the outcomes. So if it's good enough, you leave it as it is and you don't add stuff just to make it more precise. And everybody wants to add things to make them more precise. Now, of course, if we, again, Going back to the clinical, the, the, the clinical uh, corollary in this, um, we have a series of indicators and we have a series of outcomes. That's represented by the boxes. We can collect these data by inventory. Some of them are tough to collect, but at least we, this very quickly points at the, 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 the most important pieces to collect on the landscape. And then between these boxes, we have the processes. The processes, those are the pieces that have been established by research. And, uh, and what we want to get to, of course, is a position where we are able to collect data on the ground according to, for instance, what we have in terms of uh, moose density, for instance, or ungulate density, depending on where you are. Some measures of landscape condition, for example, in terms of your linear feature density and your early seral. And then to make some predictions about what, it, what, the, what the consequences of those parameters are for what we think is happening on the ground. And we express that in a way that is uh, that is based on probability. So if we have that situation, how many wolves do we think are out there? It's uncertain, but we can take some guess based on the research that we've, that's already gone on. And based on that number of wolves, if we carry through that uncertainty, what would we expect to see in terms of lambda? What's the most likely outcome? And then the question, of course, is that, A, is that an acceptable outcome? And is that outcome predicted with sufficient precision for management purposes, yes or no? And then as we move forward and implement a certain policy to reach some sort of conclusion to, to some, some sort of uh, desired outcome, as we start collecting inventory data from these boxes, the question is, are, are outcomes becoming more certain or are they becoming more uncertain? And if they become more uncertain, then that points to additional work we have to do to understand those processes and maybe add complexity to the model and improve the precision. But that's, that's basically the way we have it set up. And if you're following my line of thought, not only do we set this up for decision making, we are also pointing now to a framework for our implementation and also for our adaptive management as well, focusing on the precision that we, that's required for our outcomes. Okay, things get a little more complicated uh, when we actually add all the pieces in. Uh, but it actually isn't that bad because we still have the main boxes that I discussed before. We have a box for moose, for wolves, and for our caribou lambda. The landscape condition has been split into two different boxes, one around the expected proportion of early seral and the other around the expected density of linear features. Uh, 
And then, as I mentioned, cost is an important element, so we added cost in there as well. All the boxes feeding into these are either from two things. One of the management actions that we can take, or secondly, stressors on the system, either natural or anthropogenic, that move things in the other way. And they all basically affect these boxes. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this particular model, but you know, you're free to have a copy of this and to, uh, and to read the draft report on, on what the actual formulation of this is. Uh, this particular model is put together as a Bayesian belief network. That's what I like to work in. It doesn't have to be that. I like it because it's very easy to propagate the uncertainty that you have in certain parameters throughout the entire model, and it can be explicitly updated with data. And you can watch to see what, when you start adding real data in there, whether your uncertainty gets lower or higher, and you can know if you're on the right track and whether or not you do have to do some refinement. What I will say is that uh, just looking at, say, the sensitivity of the model, the consequence, now we're talking about the consequence of, of uh, what people have told us about how we think the system is working, uh, that not surprisingly, and echoing what everybody has said, the sensitivity to the density of wolves is highest, in the, lambda, the sensitivity to the lambda is highest in terms of wolf density. And next to that, obviously, is prey density because that directly influences wolf density. Uh, the early serial piece and linear features are quite a bit lower. And uh, I'm a little bit surprised that the linear features have come out as low as they have here. I think that's largely because the feedback we've been receiving is, this, is that we believe that the, the effect of those linear features uh, saturates quite quickly at a low density. So in fact, you have to do a whole lot to move the output of that lambda a little bit. That doesn't mean that the effect of linear features is small. It just means that the sensitivity of, uh, of the model to the linear features is low. So going forward, how are we going to apply this? Well, there's a, a shorter term strategy and a bit of a longer term strategy. The shorter term strategy is that we've been using the model to assess the feasibility of some proposed management objectives. And the most obvious of those are the Environment Canada uh, objectives that are in the recovery strategy. And as I said, those objectives are about recovering all the herds everywhere, just taking longer to recover those that are in worse shape. And they, did no fee they didn't undertake any sort of feasibility to determine what, what you would actually do, have to do to achieve that. And so they sit out there as sort of these aspirational objectives. But we can actually say, OK, well, if your objective, their short-term objective is to have a positive, a stable or positive population trajectory in all those herds within five years. So we can test that and figure out what would it take to actually do that within that five-year period. And what we find, not surprisingly, is that they're basically advocating a giant wolf kill. I don't know if they realize that's exactly what they're advocating, but that's pr pretty much where you land on that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, but that's the consequence of what they're suggesting. The second thing that we're using this for in the longer term is to guide investments by the research and effectiveness monitoring board. So this was mentioned by Chris yesterday, and Mitt also mentioned it. And this is the body that will, is being established in Northeast BC which is responsible for the uh, disbursement of about $2 million a year in funding over the next five years. And that funding is going to have to be allocated amongst those six herds. It's going to have to be allocated amongst research, uh, inventory, and boots on the ground work. And so we need some way of allocating that money. And if you want to allocate that money most efficiently, it's important to know exactly what your objectives are for each one of those herds what the likely outcome is of the different things that you're going to do, and the uncertainty that's associated with them, so you can make some intelligent decisions. So summing up, returning to the last mile, we have all this information, we have this body of information, but we're not packaging it in a way that it's mo can be used most effectively by managers and decision makers. And what we're finding that the best way to do that is to develop what I refer to here as these management models that strictly describe what is, that are transparent to decision makers and to stakeholders so we can understand what the mechanisms are. That gives us the foundation for sound decision making because we can look at those consequences and make the trade-offs where we think they need to be made. And not only that, that can live on into the implementation phase and guide our investments in how we allocate the, the limited funds we have 
and gives us the framework for managing adaptively as we move forward. So the only real question is, what is FRI's management model going to look like? As I said, these aren't optionals. We, they're, we're not, they're not optional. We're going to have one. The only question is how explicit it's going to be and who's going to be involved in development.